Hello and welcome to part three of the seven tips and tricks series. Now, as you know, this series is divided slightly differently than the others. So this one is divided by the level of expertise. And this one is expert, right? So the highest level, I might even do a one above that uh, in the future. But for now, this is the highest level that's going to come out. And I'll be honest, I'm not going for the obvious ones, right? Um, so because I really want these to, uh, to have value, this video is to have value. I'm also aiming for each video to give at least three, four new things to each Excel user. Um, that's why some of these might seem, you know, kind of out there. Uh, but that is the point. So that is the point that I was going for. And I think it will reflect in the video. So seven tips and tricks for the expert level starting now. Now, trick number one, it's all about the inquire add-in. Now the inquire add-in is not getting as much love as it should. Uh, so inquire add-in is actually a com add-in. So if you want to add it, you'll go to the developer tab. Uh, com add-ins and here's where you'll find it check and okay and then you have the inquire add-in now the inquire add-in each and every you know uh, tool up here is brilliant but there are free that you just can't live without if you're working with excel now the first one is kind of silly it's workbook analysis where you just say, okay, you know what? I just got this workbook. I have no idea what's in it. Let's create an analysis of it. And what it will do is it will go for the entire workbook and it will give you the basic analysis. And usually I'll stick to the summary because that one tells you a lot. So, okay, never mind the first few, which are properties of the file. Um, then you go into how many visible sheets are there how many hidden how many very hidden sheets we'll talk about that later um, how many formulas are in here right how many array formulas are in here how many formulas are in here that return errors right sometimes if it's a huge workbook you can't tell you don't know how many errors are in there this will tell you right so it's just the idea of getting a feel for the workbook that's in front of you um, this is a great tool and then you can export the the report that you're seeing uh, obviously to Excel and you know you can then analyze it further but this is brilliant really brilliant now the other one um, that I love is clean access cell formatting uh, I do a lot of trainings and in those trainings usually at the end um, I will give out my email and I'll say, if you have questions, you know, you can reach out to this email and usually I'll get a question, uh, that will say something like this. I have a file, there's about 10 rows of data in it, but it's 50 megs or let's say five megs, right? It shouldn't be even that. And the reason being is there's so much access cell formatting in that file it just blows up in size. Now this one button gets rid of all that. So you take that huge file, one button, and now you have a small lean file that you can use. A uh, brilliant. And for the last, uh, you know, of the three greatest hits from this one, compare files. Now this one is just unbeatable. If so, you know, you send a file to someone and he returns it to you the next day, you can see it doesn't match, uh, but you don't know what he changed, right? You, you have no idea where he went, what he changed. And now it's that is as simple as opening the two files, saying compare files, selecting the two files, saying compare. And let me just, because uh, I think this will be whole screen now. Let me see. Yeah. So let me make that one smaller. And here's the report that you get. Now. 
every time I see this report, I'm kind of thinking about Excel 2007. I don't know why, uh, but it's a brilliant report, right? It shows you each and every sheet and you can see the values on that sheet, right? So each and every sheet and it shows you the values and it also shows you the differences, right? It highlights the differences and you can see kind of the legend of the highlights over here. And you can also get a little, you know, chart of what are the differences and you also get a list of those. So if I say, what is this? Well, these two are actually different in a background color. Right? Uh, or actually, I think it's actually the text color. Um, but anyways, it's the formatting that these two differ in. Whereas these, it's a different value in these two, right? It's a different value. And since I'm calculating these with Rand Array, it makes sense it's a different value, but still, you see, it finds all those. And if I just go through some things in here, um, I think you're gonna find them extremely useful. First one, I love this one, is of course, entered values, calculated values and formulas. That's the gist of it, right? That's what Excel is for and that's, it's great to see. Then you have the structural differences. So a sheet was added, um, you know, two columns were added. Names differences, right? If somebody created a named range or created a table with a name, and macros, right? It even highlights if a VBA code has changed. Um, cell protection, cell formats. So it goes through everything and it tells you what the differences are. And this, I think, is really, really brilliant. Um, a brilliant tool. So the Inquire add-in, something that every, every Excel expert should have in his, uh, as one of the uh, tabs up here. Uh, okay, number two, forecast sheet. So here's just a little data of how many views my uh, YouTube channel is getting. Um, so since I started on the 28th of March, 2021, um, you know, this is how the views went. Don't know what happened here, but this is how the views went. Uh, and what if I wanted to go beyond just, you know, having this descriptive analytics, right? So up to, was this yesterday? Yeah, up to uh, November 6th, which was yesterday, this is the amount of views I got yesterday. Now, what would be the forecast from here on out? Well, there is something in, in, in Excel, it's called the forecast sheet. And what you do is you have to have data that is somehow, um, you know, you have to have enough data points and you have to have a structure in that data, yearly, monthly, weekly, whatever, daily, but it needs that structure to create a forecast. And here's what you have. So you say, I want a forecast sheet and basically you already have your forecast. Um, but it's not just that, there's a lot of options you have here. Um, up to where you want that forecast. And I'll just say go to January 1st. Um, where does the forecast start? Well, that's not a, you know, it's not a very uh, shockingly that we'll start on November 6th, but you could actually take it like two weeks back and see how the forecast would do against the actual data, right? So you could kind of see how good it is. Uh, you can change the confidence interval, which would be these two. Right, so how exact you want those two to be. Um, and then you have the seasonality, right? Because with, with YouTube, what I noticed, I don't know if that's a rule even, uh, I don't, maybe I don't even have enough data, um, but usually weekends would be slower and then during the week, not Fridays necessarily, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that would be the high peak of views. So it does sort of have that seasonality to it, right? Um, and I'll just say detect manually, but I could set it to seven because that's the number of days in a week, right? And I just say create and it gives me, so this is the gist of it, right? It's this chart over here. And I can see that the number of views will only rise, only rise till, 
December 28th, or maybe even before that, when it will be at the highest it ever was, right? Um, and what's also great about this, it's, it, it does not only give you this chart, it actually gives you a table where you have your forecasted values right here, right? And you also have the, uh, the interval, so the high and the low, and the forecasted value right here. So this is a brilliant, brilliant tool. So that would be your forecast sheet. Now, data validation. Data validation, you know, everybody knows it. It's the best way to trick your uh, co-workers with, you know, giving them, uh, the computer will reset in three seconds, close everything and say, or your uh, hard disk will, uh, What, what, what is that called, will format itself and, you know, that's the way you kid your coworkers. But over here, what we're trying to do is this. We have two, um, two years of data and for each one of those, we have a list of cities that I was a speaker at, so in 2018, I spoke at this cities. I don't think that's actually all of them, but it doesn't matter. Um, in 2019, I spoke at this cities, right? And here's what I would like to have. So I already have the drop down menu of 2018 and 2019. Now, what I want here is I sort of want a dependent drop down. So if I select 2018, I want to see this list of values. But if I select 2019, I want to see this list of values in the drop down. So a dependent dropdown. Now, the way you would do that is it's actually a twofold. First thing you need to do is you actually need to create two named ranges. And I'm just going to create them from the data I have. So create from selection and the left column has the names, right? And the names are 2018 and 2019. And I can see it did kind of a funny thing. So I'm just going to. I'm going to change things up a little bit. I'm going to call this year 2018 and I'm going to call this one year 2019. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select year 2018 now, right? Because it feeds from these two cells. So that's how it's created. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the name manager and I'm going to change these two. So I'm going to edit them and I'm going to change the name so that it actually is year 2018 and year 2019. Okay. So this is what I have, right? I have two named ranges. It's year 2018 and those are these. And I have year 2019, which are these. And now I'm going to use a function nobody ever uses. Um, and it goes something like this. So if cell A4 had 100 in it, and then somewhere down here, I would have a A4. And then somewhere over here, I would do equals indirect of this cell. Can you guess what I'm going to get? I'm going to get 100. Why am I going to get 100? Well, because that's how indirect works. So you send it to, to a range where it actually gets the information where it was supposed to go. So it got to A12 and that's where it saw, oh, I actually need to go to A4 and that's what I need to return, right? It's like adding an extra hop. And if you have no idea what to do with this function, um, Here's what you can do with this function. If I now say, let's create a data validation list and the source is equals indirect of this cell. Right? So what do I get? Well, now I get this. See, there's London in there because that's the difference. Right? And Sarajevo in once is Belgrade. And now I go 2019. And there it is. Now I have Perth and now I have Belgrade. So this is a dependent drop down list from 
whatever I pick up here. It's a brilliant use of a function that, you know, you don't really get to use that often. Um, and also, how does it work? Well, what it does is it goes into this cell and it reads what the range it was supposed to be looking at is called. So the range it was supposed to be looking at is called year 2019. And what is that? Well, we named this 2019. So that's what this will be created from, right? So indirect, brilliant thing. Okay, then we go on, let. So I'm not gonna go into, you know, uh, too far out with this example. Uh, but let's just do this. Let's create a simple sum of all of these right down here. And then over here, let's do a let, right? And the first thing the let lets you do is you assign a name to whatever will be in the second uh, argument of the function. So the first thing is a name, and I'm going to call this my sum, right? And what will that be? Well, that will be a sum of this. And how will I use it? Well, I will use it by creating an if function. And what I'll say is if my sum is greater than, and let's go for 29,000. So if my sum is greater than 29,000, then I want you to just give me my sum. But if it's not, if it's smaller than 29,000, then I want you to give me my sum and let's say plus 5,000. Oh, that one doesn't work, so there it is. Plus 5,000, like this, like this, and let it rip. So what happened? Well, it calculated the sum, and the sum is 24,000 at this point. And because that is less than 29,000, what it did is it added 5,000, there you go. Now let's recalculate this. So let's go calculate. Okay, and I'm just aiming for one that would be bigger than, which I'm obviously not gonna get anytime soon. Three more tries, oh, there it is, right? So if the sum is greater than 29,000, then it just returns the sum. Now, what does the let function let you do? Well, basically what it lets you do is, you see how this would actually be a pain to write? right? Because this would be a sum of that, and this would be a sum of that, and this would be a sum of that. But now you can just wrap this into a name, and then write your function by just using that name, instead of rewriting the whole function thing. Now, those of you that are familiar with Power BI and DAX, you already know the let function. That's how you, you know, sort of create your variables in there. Um, but over here, it's a let function. And this is a very important step towards making Excel a even better programming language. Um, it, there's, there's a lot behind that. Um, but this is a very important step. So the let function, brilliant thing to have in your arsenal. Okay, next one, simple very hidden sheet. So if you have a sheet uh, that other sheets use, right? So you have some intermediate results here or some formulas or some data that you don't want other people to see. What you can always do is write, you can hide this sheet. Well, but if you hide it, anyone can do unhide, see that, that one is hidden and just say, okay. But there's another thing you can do. You can go into Visual Basic. Now you can do that with Alt F11, or you can just go to the Developer tab, go to Visual Basic, and here you can find this sheet, right? And what you can also see, not right now, but let's bring those up. So the Properties window, right that. Oh, there it is. So that this sheet has some properties, and one of them is what's the visibility of it? And right now it's visible. And then I have hidden, which we saw before, but then I also have very hidden. And now if I press this one, 
Um, it seems it didn't work, but that's because it switched the um, to the next sheet. So if I go back to this one, it is very hidden. And if I now go back to Excel, there is no sheet five very hidden and there's nothing to unhide because as far as Excel is concerned, nothing is hidden, right? And if I want to unhide it, I just go back to the developer tab, visual basic, find it and just go. Now this one is visible and there it is. So a very handy trick. Okay, next one. Uh, this one is not utilized as much as it should be. Um, so if we have data and this is a, just a simple list of people it's actually got some Slovenian names, Slovenian addresses. Um, and now I want to create a pivot table out of this, right? Usually what you would do is you would go insert pivot table and more or less okay. But there's a checkbox here. It's add this data to the data model. Now, you could use that uh, because you want to uh, create a power pivot model and you want to, you know, create connections and all that. But you could also use that just to do this. So add this to the data model. Go OK. Mm -mm -mm. OK, so there's something. He says there's something wrong with the. Oh, sorry. I can see what's wrong. Is this one. Let's just delete that one. So let's remove that one entirely. And let's take this data and let's go. So I want to insert a pivot table. right? but I want to add it to the data model. So let's go. It does that. There's just a slight difference that you're going to notice if you add it to the data model. And that is now there's this table up here, but, but it's still just a list of fields, nothing special about that. But now you can do this. Now you can go, okay. So by company, by department, let's calculate salary, right? And Let's calculate the average of that. So far, nothing special. Um, let's just go for the position up here. So add it as a slicer like this, right? So now I can calculate those by different positions. And now here comes the magic. Because when you have a pivot table, pivot table is, oh my God, it's so hard to, to make it look, you know, the par. And then if you wanna, if I wanna insert a column here, no way, right? But now, uh, and there's more that you can do because you add it to the data model, but this is the greatest feature. Now you can take this pivot table and you can say, well, I want to take this pivot table, OLAP tools, and I want to convert it to formulas. And here's the trick about it. Now these are just cells. Now I can insert a column, go it's this minus this. I can do any calculations I want, but watch this. It's still a pivot table. It still behaves like a pivot table, right? So that is one brilliant thing that you get if you create a pivot table by adding it to the data model. Because what you get is it will get added into Power Pivot, and basically it becomes an OLAP cube. So your data model is an OLAP cube, and because it's an OLAP cube, the pivot table OLAP tools will be live and you can convert it to formulas a great great thing uh, because now you have calculations that can be fed by uh, by slicers which is brilliant two things to keep in mind there is no going back so you can't convert it back to the pivot table and another thing to keep in mind um, if there will be another company added to my list it will not show up in here so it's not live in a sense that power pi that the pivot table is. Pivot table, you can do right click refresh and it will get in here. Over here, you can't do that. So it wouldn't work. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind, but you could add it manually because all of these are just cube formulas. So cube member, cube value, that's what this is. And you could add a cube member if a new cube member appeared, right? Um, but basically, this has got to be one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. Okay, so that is a pivot as formulas. So a pivot table as formulas. And last but not least, a very, very unknown feature of Excel. And, it, and it's, 
it's brilliant. And let me just get rid of this as I did before. So shift cells left like this. Okay, so this is an advanced filter, right? We all know filters, we use them every day, we create a filter, we say this company, this company and all that. And the problem with filters is there is always end in between whatever you pick, right? So if I say the company will be Microsoft and the department, and I even said it, and the department will be a one. So this is what I get, that and that. But sometimes your filters are more intricate. And sometimes you would want to do something like this. What I would like to see is, I would like to see people that work at Microsoft in department A2. Or people that work at Google in department A3. Right, so how would you do that? Well, with regular filters, you actually can, because what are you gonna say? I'm gonna say, well, it's Google and Microsoft, okay? And then the department is, well, it's either this one or this one. But if I omit any one of them, I've lost data. And if I select them both, I have too much data. So there's no way to get to the desired result by simply using regular filters. And that's where advanced filter comes in. And for advanced filter, this is the, uh, let's say, official way how to use it. So what you do is you create a copy of your uh, header row. And then what you do is you're filling in rows. And the way you're filling in rows is whatever has an end in between, those conditions are in the same row. So what did I say? I said, it's Microsoft and a two. Well, that goes in the same row and then it's or and that goes in a separate row or it's Google. And let's just make it interesting. Let's say I'm not even go for going to go for the department. I'm going to go for the salary. So salary is greater than and let's say 1100. There it is. Right. So this is my advanced filter. And the way I use it is I go to my data, I go to data and then select advanced. So advanced filter. Now the list range, it got that correctly. What is my criteria range? And what I select is my header row plus all the rows that I filled. Right? That's, that's the only thing I select. And filter the list in place, okay. And that is it. If I now see Google up here, then the salary is greater than 1,100. So 1, but if I see Microsoft, then it's gonna be A2 as a department, right? So it's or, or. Brilliant, brilliant thing. Um, and just so you know, this is the official way how to use them. It would work just the same if you didn't have any of these. Um, let me just do this and this. So if you only had the columns that you need and there's no rule that says they need to be in the same order that they need to be in the same place. So you could have it like this. The only thing you need, sorry, let me get rid of that. And let me try now just to push this over here. There it is. So this is now my filter range. You can see how it changed. And this is my data and I can go data advanced. And then I say filter criteria range is now just this. Right, so that's all I need. I need the headers of the columns that I want to filter. And the order doesn't matter. It's just it's got to be the same title, the same header. Um, and I go OK. And it did exactly the same as it did before. Right. And that is advanced filter. It's not getting as much love as it should. Uh, but, you know, uh, it really is a useful, useful uh, tool in Excel. Okay. I hope you learned something new. This was a long one, uh, but if you learned something new, then it was all worth it. So these were seven tips and tricks, expert level. Uh, there might be 
an extra extra expert level uh, if you want that please leave a comment below maybe you can even leave what you would want to have as a topic uh, but anyways that's it for this one thank you for watching and i'll see you on the next one